I want to start by welcoming co wonderful colleagues who are here tonight and a very, very special welcome to every member of the class of 2016. We're going to start this evening. I'm going to ask you to just sit up a little taller. Take a very deep breath. You have all been working very, very hard this week to get everything done. You've been moving at a really quick pace. And then you were dancing a lot last night. This is the moment to slow down. I'm pretty sure that every single person in this room has been looking forward to this evening for a very long time. And now it's here. This is the moment that marks the beginning of our 2016 commencement weekend. I feel blessed to have gotten to know so many of you over the years in biology classrooms, in the pool. If you were in West Quad South when you were a ninth grader, I had the privilege of being your cluster dean. There are many, many Andover traditions that I cherish deeply. And the community convocation is truly one of my favorite occasions. A quick glance at your program, and you've already seen that this is going to be an extraordinary array of speakers and performers tonight. This evening also marks the last time that this group of caring adults will be in this space with the class of 2016, as tomorrow will be with your, with your families. This is a beautiful meeting space for all school meetings, for concerts, for worship, for reflection, and it's wonderful to be here with you this evening. Dr. Cantor will offer us an invocation, and then our distinguished speakers will introduce themselves each as they come up in the order indicated in your program. Enjoy this evening's. Good evening, and let me add a welcome on behalf of the chapel staff. So says Oprah Winfrey, even more delectable than a delicious meal is a delicious experience, rich and layered like a fine coconut cake, she says. It is my privilege to invite you all into this delicious experience tonight. A layered and lavish feast filled with companionship, Musing, memories, music, beautiful music, and of course, fine food. So I offer this invocation of grace and thanks for all of the riches set before us on this night. As the year draws to its end, we give thanks for the gifts it's given. We bless this year for all of its learning, its love, its loss, its quiet way that it nurtured us towards our life destinations. As we begin this evening, let us be mindful of that which was nourished by the earth to become our food tonight of the work of many strangers and friends whose hands prepared our meal, of health and wealth and all that enables us to feast and celebrate tonight. Open your eyes and see the friends around you whose hearts recognize you as kin, as family. 
Look at those whose kindness, watchfulness, nearness encouraged you to everything that is here at Phillips Academy. Now is the time to free your hearts. Let all intentions and worries cease. Free the joy in you. Awaken gratitude and exuberance for this moment right now. You are seated at a banquet. That which refreshes pours forth from fine pitchers. Partake, my friends, drink deeply, dine well. Let the feasting begin. Amen. My greatest fear is that I won't have the words to express how I feel. Andover has been my everything, but there isn't a word for that. And if I do find the right words, I don't want to simply be remembered for them. Our lives are more complicated than that. Moments like these ask a lot of us. They ask us to look deep into our souls, and we are told that if we look deep enough, we just might, something, we just might find something worth holding on to. That's how we've come to believe in reflection. So when Andover and I reflect with each other, I have come to believe that I am not Andover. I am not Andover. These ceilings are too high, the wood is too old, the rows of pews in this chapel stretch far too long. Many nights I've stood in this empty room, longing for the day that I can move on. But as my voice begins to reach you all, perhaps there's something left to reach towards, something we have yet to share together, something that we can still create together, happiness. On the eve of our graduation, dare I say, it's not over. Things can change. Our memories are no exception for the way we access these memories will shape the memories themselves. Seniors, don't graduate to move on. Graduate to move forward. Graduate to remember within these walls that has been inscribed for the last four years and the last 200. Goodness without knowledge is weak, while knowledge without goodness is dangerous. If that's true, then let me be weak. Let me begin with goodness. And perhaps I can find something else along the way, knowledge, Love, tears, turbulence, frustration, hope, belonging. You've shown it all to me. I can never get away with only knowledge, and I was never left alone with hopelessness. Let my voice sing what it means to struggle, what it means to have doubt and insecurity, even now to stand before you all and to not quite have the right words. Andover is not easy, so let us look to the past, not with rose-colored lenses, but with a soul that longs for understanding, a soul that longs to see triumph and the struggle, freedom through the struggle. I have looked and I have seen the cage that holds me in, but if cages can be seen, then they too can be broken. See the cage each time the iron links together, a space is made in the process, and we must not forget these spaces. There is room for you and you and you and you and you. There is room for each of us. The function of freedom is to free someone else. Toni Morrison, so let us wrap our fingers together around the iron, break the chains off for each other. This is what goodness means. Though we know not what lies beyond, we know what lies within. And if we know what lies within, we know who stands with us. Then in the name of goodness, let us come together and rethink the way we see each other. Rethink the way we treat each other. Let us remember what it means to graduate as a class and not as individuals. Let us understand ourselves through the person beside us. 
those who have been amongst these pews and pillars before and those yet to come. Though I say that I am not Andover, Andover is in us, we are Andover. In you, 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 my fellow seniors, who know what it means to think deeply, to love deeply, to reach for the goodness in all people, take the goodness we have, the goodness we are capable of, and inscribe it every place we go. Thank you.
Hello faculty, adults of the Andover community, and of course, class of 2016. I just want to start off by saying it's absolutely an honor to be speaking in front of all of you tonight. When I came to Andover for my freshman year on September 7th, 2012, I came with my blatant naivety, bustling curiosity, over-eagerness, bright pink backpack, bright pink raincoat, and let's not forget my bright pink umbrella that I chose to fashion all at once. I had my work cut out for me here, to say the least. But that was the beauty of being a freshman. We had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. Whoever's bright idea it was to put 14 through 19 year olds together at a high school away from home and not expect them to face some of the most incredible challenges and hardships of their lives was out of their mind. I'll be the first to share that Upper Spring was one of the most difficult time periods I've ever had to face. My grades were falling, my relationships were all over the place, I was insecure, self-conscious, and I found it very hard to seek a way out of my depressive state then. By the start of my senior fall, after a much needed summer vacation, I returned to Andover with a much more cynical view of the place. For my English elective, I was lucky enough to be placed in Rosebud, taught by the one and only Mr. Bardo. I bring up this specific class because when I was reflecting on memorable moments that I have had with faculty, this one conversation I had with Mr. Bardo continued to come to the forefront of my mind. For class one day, we simply had to show up, turn in the missive that we were assigned to write. So in the middle of second period, I strolled into class, expecting to turn in my paper, exchange a few pleasantries, and continue on my way. After doing the usual how are you's, Mr. Bardo proceeded to ask me about my Andover experience, and in his casual yet slick manner, he hit me with a serious question. Was Andover worth it? All pink doting freshman year Taylor would have jumped at the answer with a resounding yes. Senior year Taylor, however, found herself paused at the question and could only respond with, it depends on how the rest of this year turns out. Well, Mr. Bardo, I apologize for the lateness of this answer, but here it is. Andover is a lot of things. It's tiring, stressful, challenging, overwhelming, and at some points, discouraging and disappointing. But Andover is also full of so many little things that we sometimes tend for, to forget make Andover worthwhile. You see, when I graduate, I'm not going to remember struggling to find motivation to write my History 310 paper senior spring or think about how many sleepless nights I had upper year in senior fall. I'm going to remember that just two weeks ago, I got to perform on this very stage with my best friend Skye and sing songs by the Queen Bee herself. <laughs> I'm going to remember spending a Friday night lower year watching Frozen and eating a pint of ice cream each with Olivia. I'm going to remember my cluster soccer team upper year winning championships, listening to the Lemonade album with my Bio 600 class, having dance parties in Smith House, and singing random songs with Lauren and Sam under the stars. It's the little things. When we, say goodbye, when we say our final goodbyes to this place in just two days, on June 5th, 2016, we'll be saying goodbye to the amazing faculty that put up with, I mean, taught, coached, and lived with us for our time here. We'll be saying goodbye to friendships that have been brewing since freshman year or were only fostered during the last few weeks of senior spring. We'll be saying goodbye to a place where we grew up, matured, and became who we are today. I encourage you all to take the time to think about the little things that made your Andover career worthwhile, because I know that they mean mine. Thank you.
Here we go. Hello. 2016. Oh, okay. Here we go. The last time I spoke to my father was in 2009. It was a year before my wedding. I'd flown back to Kansas City to tell my father about my plans. The phone conversations leading up to that moment had been as they always were, fraught, bizarre at best. I would call my father at my childhood home, he would answer the phone, he would exchange pleasantries with me, and then immediately he would pass the phone off to his new wife, Audrey, a woman I had nev never known nor met. I couldn't explain his behavior in those moments, I still can't, but I can tell you that it made me feel quite small and insignificant. 
Audrey did the best she could in these awkward situations. She would rattle on about her own daughter and her grandson. She'd explain to me that, my associate, that by association they were my family too. She would talk about the changes she had made to my childhood home. She was trying her best to create some kind of rapport between us. Unfortunately, that relationship was one that required my father's careful introduction. For reasons that I will probably never know, he wasn't able to do that. Despite the circumstances of how I came to learn about their involvement, I was relieved slightly by their union. You see, I am, slash was, an only child. My mother, in her infinite wisdom, had sensed already the growing chasm between my father and me. I imagine she had pleaded with him, much like she had pleaded with me, to make things right. Suffice to say that during that weekend in Kansas City, something broke between me and my father. Few words were exchanged. Things weren't, they weren't needed, <clears throat> because prior to that horrible moment, most of our conversations ended with me feeling defeated and weeping on the floor. But we couldn't come back from what had happened between us. Ultimately, I wasn't able to honor my mother's wishes. I still haven't. That decision to excise my father from my life was not a light one. It was painful, and it remains unresolved to this day. Let me be clear. My position is not one that I advocate, even though it was necessary for me. I also recognize that he lives, and we still have an opportunity to do something together. But his absence in my life has been enormous to me personally, as well as to my family. My father has never met my husband or my daughters. Even as I continue to build my family with my friends and colleagues, some of whom share this space with us now, I feel his presence often. Yet my choice to disengage, to stop speaking and communicating is far greater than me. I have taught Toni Morrison's Beloved to my students in African American literature for several years. It is beyond a doubt the best work of fiction that captures the emotional and psychic effects of slavery during Reconstruction. In those haunting 275 pages, Morrison creates an America wherein freedom and agency are denied, conferred, and ultimately affirmed. Inspired by the true story of an escaped slave woman, the novel's protagonist is a woman who escaped slavery and lives freely for 28 days in Cincinnati, Ohio. On the 20th day, her slave owner and other men arrive to retrieve her and her children to take them back to Kentucky under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. What ensues is a harrowing tale of loss, love, shame, humility, and forgiveness. If I were to put my students on the spot and ask them to think about which character's initial journey arose his sense of self, I imagine they would say Paul D. Right? OK, thank you. He's a complex character who suffers great humiliations, yet ultimately he chooses to live. Paul D. is, as Morrison describes him, quote, the kind of man who would walk into a house and make the women cry. Because with him, in his presence, they could. There was something blessed in his manner, end quote. Such softness, however, does not excuse his mean streak nor belie the gut-wrenching sadness that he cannot name. When Paul D. first attempts to speak about his emotions, he decides that, quote, saying more might push him to a place he couldn't get back from. He would keep the rest where it belonged, in that tin tobacco can buried in his chest where a red heart used to be, its lid rusted shut. He would not pry it loose, for if he got a whiff of the contents, it would shame him, and it would hurt to know that there was no red heart beating in him, end quote. Just like all the characters in Morrison's tale, Paul D's story is about the function and power of memory and how we must retell our stories in order to survive. My father is a proud man. He's an amazing storyteller. When he's on telling a hilarious story, he loves to laugh and smile. From him, I've inherited my keen taste in fashion jazz, R&B, and pop music. As a matter of fact, my father purchased for me my first album, Prince's magnum opus, Purple Rain. But my father is also a difficult man. He can be profoundly cruel and irrational. I imagine that 
Much of why he wasn't able to speak to me is buried deep in his memories of home. What I remember most about my father's Southern stories was the need for him to get out. You see, my father is a black man from the South. He was born and raised in Cotton Valley, Louisiana. In the 2010 census, the population was less than 1,000 people. My father is the youngest of Chin children. He's the descendant of slaves, the son of sharecroppers. My father remembers picking cotton as a young boy with his mother. He attended segregated schools for all of his formative years. My father remembers the Klan riding through his town and into his front yard. While these factors don't excuse my father's behaviors toward me, they certainly help me to understand them because he is my own Paul D. But you all have Paul D's too. We all do. Adults and places disappoint, challenge, and rage, but they also define, create, and enliven. Empathy lies at the heart of humanistic acts. It's not trite. It's not simply Atticus Finch telling Scout to rock, walk around in another man's shoes, but rather, it's incredibly difficult. Our jobs as readers and learners is to walk quietly next to Morrison as she tells us this story. You will never be at an institution that is as diverse as ours is. That is a gift that knows no bounds. The novel reminds us of three things. The importance of memory, when we bumble around in the dark, how our memories help us make sense of who we are. That words matter, language matters, its absence as well as its presence. And finally, gratitude. How are you reading and processing in these final moments? Are you taking advantage of moments for gratitude and thanks? It's not about how much you struggled here, how much you hate it, how much you dream of never returning, how much you lost, learned, and loved, but rather, each of us has something for which to be grateful. In part, those human beings, old and young, who sit next to you are what matter. So say it now, say it tonight, say it Sunday. This is almost over. But what you ultimately take away from this begins now. Thank you.
class of 2016, you are very good looking, as you see. <laughs> you are very charming, you are very funny, and you've come a very long way. Congratulations. Pretty much every time I have stood before the student body in this chapel, I've been with you. We started together four years ago. And it is a great pride with which I and everybody else will be sending you out in these few days upon the great journey that will follow Andover. I wanted to end at least what I say to you in the chapel with two Andover traditions. The first is to bring you back to the very first time when you were here as a new student. And one of the things that I asked you to do was to find your angel. You may remember this. You probably thought it was pretty hokey. It is very hokey, but it's a lovely tradition. I noted back then what Taylor would report to you, that there would be difficult days at Andover, that there would be challenging moments when you needed a little bit of support. There would be very snowy days. There would be very long days. There would be that upper spring. And hopefully that you would come in and find your angel if you needed it in this room. But the secret behind that tradition is that the angel merely stands for something. And those who are religious may think it stands for something heavenly. And of course, for you, I hope it does. But it really stands for a different proposition. It stands for the proposition that in this very room are your angels. The angels for you at Andover are the students who are next to you and the adults who have cared for you in the deepest possible ways. Now you know where those angels really are. And I hope when you were able to come in here and look up and find your angel, you also found them beside you. The second of the Andover traditions, and this tradition is going to bear us to dinner. So I need two people. I need Kato Mahanya and I need Elizabeth Dusarik. Would you please come up here? So if you two would come over here with this banner, this is a very special thing. Why don't you actually come to the middle, maybe, and unfurl it so everybody will see it. This banner is like a time capsule. You will follow it today, in fact, in about two minutes. You will follow it through a beautiful evening over to the Smith Center. We'll go in there and have dinner. But then we will set it aside. We will set it aside for you. Because if history repeats itself, and I expect that it will, a majority of you, five years from now, five years plus one week, in June of 2021, it's hard to say, June of 2021, you will come back for your fifth reunion. And when you do, you will walk behind that banner together once again. You will come back and do that. And then five years after that, in 2026, for your 10th reunion, you will walk behind that same banner. And if history repeats itself, it may be at your 70th reunion that you will walk behind that banner as well. So that banner will be kept very carefully here with lots of love in our hearts and thoughts of you on this campus. Okay, so in a moment, what's gonna happen is that the organ is gonna play and these guys are gonna walk out and we're all gonna follow it. We're going to follow across the uh, Great Lawn, although if possible, I would ask you to stay on the pavement and keep off the grass. You've heard this before. I ask you, no zigzagging necessary, I ask you just to stay on the pavement in the interest of preserving the grass for your own graduation on Sunday. And we will arrive at the Smith Center and you will then enter by the side door, the side that faces the baseball diamond, and we will have dinner then. But before we go, I would like a final thank you. A final thank you to all those amazing musicians. A final thank you to Taylor and Andrew and Dr. Hawthorne, who in a relatively short period of time to the rest of you will become Tasha. 15 years, all right, now we know. 15th reunion, which will be in 2031, behind that banner, you may call Dr. Hawthorne Tasha. All right, may we please have one 
rousing, rousing, rousing round of applause for those speakers and those musicians. Congratulations. And a truly final thank you. This event is coordinated by those in the Office of Alumni Relations Engagement. This is their beginning of their relationship with all of you. I would like to thank our team, Ms. Hout, Ms. Savino, and others who are putting on your first real alumni event. To Ms. Savino, Ms. Hout, and your teams, thank you. And when they, when they send you emails to come to dinners or come back to campus, you need to respond yes, because we want to see you. All right, we're going to have some organ, and Cato and Elizabeth, please lead us to dinner in the Smith Center. Congratulations.